stability of the Gessner angle vortex along the flow of the Ross Pitaevsky equation, uh, which is the natural uh, equation corresponding to the Ginsberg Lando energy. So, first, the Ross Pitaevsky equation. This is this nonlinear polygon equation. Uh, this is an equation with a cubic nonlinearity that is depth focusing. And uh, I will consider this equation for a function psi uh, of the world space. And due to the fact that the vortex solutions are uh, defined in dimension two, essentially the dimension will be equal to two. So this equation appears as a toy model in various areas uh, in physics. Uh, first in uh, quantum mechanics, where it is a model for Bose-Einstein condensation and as a consequence also for uh, superfluidity or superconductivity. And it is also a model in nonlinear optics for the propagation of dark solitons. Uh, dark solitons are exactly the uh, turning weight for this equation in dimension one. Uh, this equation is Hamiltonian. And uh, it's natural Hamiltonian is the uh, Gessner-Landau energy, which is given uh, by this uh, term. Uh, in this equation, actually, we see that the vortex solution have an infinite means Bernardo energy, so that we have to work a little uh, in order to uh, provide a good setting for a constructing solution to the Cauchy problem to this equation. Uh, in general, in the Hamiltonian framework, you can notice that uh, due to the potential term, which is here, in some sense, the modulus of psi is going to tend to one at infinity. And this uh, makes the analysis of uh, this equation a bit different from the usual analysis of nonlinear Schrodinger equation, uh, for which the uh, function is supposed to tend to zero at uh, infinity. In particular, if you want to look at the dispersion relation, you have to linearize around the constant solution of modulus one, for instance, one. And then you find a dispersion relation which is not the same as the usual one for the non for the linear Schrodinger equation. Further remark uh, concerning this equation, it turns out to be completely integrable by means of the inverse scattering transform in dimension one. And in particular, at least formally, there is a, a description of the long time dynamics in dimension one that is governed by the propagation of a certain number of curving waves that are called solitons in dimension one plus a list. That's in this talk, I am interested only in uh, stationary solutions. Because the vortex solutions are stationary solutions of the universe. So if you look at stationary solutions, you have to solve the Ginsberg-Landau equation. Not here, but this is not the usual Ginsberg-Landau equation in the sense that there is no small parameter at uh, the denominator of the potential term. This is due to the fact that here you are in the world space in dimension two in the sequel. And then you can make the scaling in order to drop this small parameter. And concerning the stationary solution, if you look at this solution in the Hamiltonian framework, uh, you can prove that the only stationary solution are constant solution. So this is something that was proved by Brazis, Mer, and Rydia in dimension two. And then this was extended to any dimension by uh, b and so. And so all of the uh, stationary solutions with finite energy are constant. And uh, due to the fact that we have finite energy, we are constant of modulus one. Uh, but it turns out that we are not the only uh, solution for these uh, equations or for this uh, nonlinear elliptic equation. It is possible in dimension two to construct a family of stationary solution but we will see that we have an infinite energy. So in order to construct this family, you have to look for solution under an equivariant form, uh, which means that you are going to write the solution of the uh, Ginsberg-Landau equation as a modulus uh, that only depends on the radial variable in polar coordinates, plus uh, a phase function uh, that is given by an integer times the angular variable of the polar coordinates. And this, uh, this solution is called the vortex solution because we are going to look 
at uh, modulus or a profile body that is going to vanish at zero. And at infinity, you can check that uh, this function has a topological degree, which is equal to the integral d. In order to do so, you can check by solving this, this equation that the profile body uh, is going to be uh, positive uh, outside from zero. And then uh, on large circle, you can define the solution by, the, by its profile. And this makes uh, a map from a large circle to a circle. And then you compute the topological degree and you see that the topological degree is exactly equal. So this is why these solutions are called vortex solution of degree. And in order to compute precisely their form, you only have to compute uh, the profile body. And in order to compute this profile, you take uh, these sensors and this equation, and then you have to solve a nonlinear ordinary differential equation, which is given by this uh, equation, with uh, a boundary value at zero, which is equal to zero. And at infinity, it is natural to assume, uh, due to the fact that you have known something at least with uh, potential energy that is finite. So it is natural to impose the condition by OD sending to one at infinity. And it was proved by Chen, Elliot, and Key, and also by Hervé and Hervé by using shooting methods that there exists a unique solution to this uh, ordinary differential equation. And this gives you this uh, vortex solution with degree. But there is a problem with this uh, solution. So uh, you can also compute to an answer at infinity of the body. And what you can check is the fact that if you take one minus the square of the body at infinity, this is uh, like one over S squared at infinity. So this means that uh, the potential energy is well defined since uh, this component is energy. But you also have to compute the kinetic energy. And when you compute the kinetic energy, what you are going to find is this equation of the square of the gradient of BD. So it is the square of the gradient of uh, the modulus. This, this square goes with square divided by x to the power 2. And uh, you know that uh, this function is sending to 1 at infinity. So this is like. Well, over the distance at the origin, the square of the distance at the origin, this is not integrable in dimension. So the kinetic term corresponding to this quantity is infinite. And this means that uh, in order to analyze uh, this vortex solution, you have to work in a setting where uh, the gains valent energy, the natural Hamiltonian, uh, is uh, infinite. So after these uh, works, there were uh, a work by uh, Belsis, Nair, and Vivier uh, concerning the stationary solution. So you can assume that they are smooth because they solve some nonlinear solution. And uh, imposing the condition that the potential term is finite. And what we observe is a phenomenon of uh, quantification. Uh, that is related to the potential term, and they prove that there exists a number d for any smooth stationary solution such that this potential term is equal to 2 pi d squared. And in this uh, formula, d uh, appears as the degree at infinity of a solution. So, what is the natural question here? It is the fact you have a family of solutions with degree d at infinity, then you have a quantification for the potential term. Are there the unique solution for the equation? And so actually, it was proved for d equal to zero by Brazis, Merl, and Kalidia. So for d equal to zero, you can see that u is a constant of modulus uh, one. And then there was a result by Meon in 1996, uh, who established that if you consider a smooth stationary solution with this condition and for d equal to plus or minus one, then the unique solution is given by the vortex solution up to the geometric invariance. So it turns out that if I come back to uh, the equation, sorry, which is here, uh, there are two classes of invariant uh, of invariances. The first one is given by translation, and the second one is given by uh, the multiplication by a uh, complex number of modulus one 
or if you prefer, by a constant phase shift. And you recover this in this uh, result since you see that U is equal to a vertex solution, but up uh, to a constant phase shift and up to a uh, just a remark concerning this result, uh, you can see using uh, this uh, expression that actually uh, when VD is a solution with a degree D, the complex conjugate of VD is a solution with degree minus D. So that in the sequel, I will only consider the case uh, where D is equal to one and not the case where D is equal to minus D. So this is a result of uh, uniqueness uh, by me on this uh, To my knowledge, the question is still open in higher dimension. Uh, I'm sorry, not for in higher dimension, but for the larger oracle. Uh, and with this result, there is also uh, some form of variational characterization of the vertex solution uh, with degree one or minus one which is the fact that uh, this uh, vertex solution has a minimizing nature. Uh, so there is a, a difficulty here to define this uh, minimizing nature, which is related to the fact that uh, the natural quantity to minimize is the gains Lando energy, but the gains Lando energy is infinite for the vertex solution V1. And so in order to Define a, a notion of uh, minimization, uh, you have to introduce a notion of locally minimizing stationary solution. So, what is this? It's simply the fact that if, if you fix some compact set, for instance, the ball with center zero and radius r, uh, you are going to say that a stationary solution is locally minimizing if and only if uh, energy on this ball uh, is. Uh, minimizer of the possible energies among perturbation on this one, or more precisely among perturbation epsilon such that epsilon is in the surface space H10. And what was proved by uh, UNESCO was the fact that uh, the only uh, non-constant locally minimizing stationary solution are the vertex solution with degree one or minus one up to the invariances, so up to translation and concentration. And actually, this is uh, a corollary of the first result, uh, since it was proved by Schaffer that uh, if you look at locally minimizing stationary solution, necessarily their degree at infinity is zero, minus one, or plus one. And it was also proved by Sandier that the potential term is finite. So using the previous uniqueness result by uh, Mironescu, you can establish then if the solution is not constant, its degree is not zero, and so uh, the unit solution is uh, uh, plus is the vertex solution uh, with uh, degree one or minus. So this is a good result in order to analyze the stability of the vertex solution, because you know that uh, if you have some minimizing property for a special solution, then it has a chance to uh, be stable under the corresponding flow of the equation. Maybe too early on a Monday morning, but I thought we were arguing that when the degree is plus or minus one, that energy is infinite. So um, it's... Yeah, uh, but here, um, in the sequel, actually, I will provide a renormalized version of the energy so that I could uh, use this idea. Okay. And so, before uh, proving uh, orbital stability, there is an ultimate step, which is to transform this result in a quantitative result. And so, in order to do that, it is natural to uh, take the uh, Lando energy on balls because it is infinite on the wall space. Then you introduce a perturbation which is in the solar space H10 on this ball, and you make uh, an extension of the energy. You have a zero order term, which is the energy of V1. The first order term is equal to zero because V1 is a critical point for this uh, quantity. And then you have the second order term and the higher order terms. And so if you are able to prove that this quantity controls the norm that is here, the control will come with uh, power two. And when epsilon is small, you have the quantity which is coercive. 
And so you have to move at the second order differential, and the second order differential is given by this uh, quadratic form. Uh, and actually, this uh, quadratic form was analyzed by uh, Miro Desprin, not on balls like this. And if you want to look at um, the same quantity but in the wall space, uh, you have to define a functional setting such that this quantity is well defined. And so, what is the natural setting? So, this term is non negative, so you put it in your uh, functional setting. This one is also non negative. And then this one has actually is non positive because uh, the square of the modulus of V1 is strictly less than one. So the natural setting is simply to change the sign here in order to have something which is uh, non negative. And this was done by uh, Delpinon, Felmer, and Kovacic. And so we introduce uh, this uh, Hilbert space HQ corresponding to the norm which is given by this uh, formula. And what we prove is the following result. Uh, that is the fact that the quadratic form Q is possibly semi-definite on this space. And uh, moreover, it is possible to uh, compute explicitly uh, the eigenfunction in the kernel. And the eigenfunction in the kernel are given by the derivatives uh, of the function V1. So uh, why the derivative actually uh, you see that what is in the kernel is related to the geometric invariances. And the derivatives here uh, correspond to the geometric invariances with respect to translation. And, uh, but there is something missing in this result, which is the fact that actually there is another geometric invariance, uh, which is the geometric invariance with respect to constant phase shift. And in the kernel, there should be the function i multiplied by v1, which corresponds to the geometric invariance with respect to constant phase shifts. But this function cannot be in the kernel. Why? Because it is not in this space. iv1, if you look at this term, uh, this term for iv1 is exactly this term. It is the kinetic energy and the kinetic energy and so this is the difficulty in order to provide um, a good result of orbital stability in the world space. And um, an important part of the work that I am going to present is actually to introduce a further functional setting in order to be able to take into account the invariance with respect to constant phase. And so before, uh, Dealing with this result of orbital stability, I have to say a word about uh, background. And so, what is the difficulty? The difficulty here is to solve the cosp Tversky equation, so this nonlinear Schrodinger equation in a setting corresponding with something uh, with uh, infinite Hamiltonian. Okay. So, for the cosp Tversky equation, but uh, in the energy space, so the functions with uh, Ginsberg Landau energy that is finite. Uh, the proof of the global wellposeness of the equation <laughs> by uh, in dimension two and three, and then in dimension four by Kelly Pro, Popov, Kuku, and Visa. So, uh, actually, uh, the setting is not the usual one of a nonlinear Schrodinger equation, but due to the fact that the equation is subcritical in dimension two and three, and um, it is also defocusing. It is possible to go back to the setting of uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation, and in particular uh, to use the three cards in estimates in order to prove uh, global wellness results in the natural energy space. Uh, but here you have to deal with the fact that the vortex uh, is uh, of infinite uh, energy, and this question was answered in a work by Baker and Smith. And uh, what they use is a uh, an idea by uh, Clément Gallo. Uh, it was to solve the uh, Cauchy problem uh, in the case of function with finite Gensberg energy, but in a setting which is a bit different from the work of Patrick Girard. Uh, so, in the world of Gallo, the main trick was to have <laughs> the initial datum as a fixed solution in the energy space, V0. But V0 in the work of Gallo is a finite energy. And then add a function with the that is in H1. And then 
what we are going to solve is the not an empty question, but we have an answer such that V0 is fixed in linear space, but and we have a function psi that is going to evolve according to the flow of the equation. And so using this idea, uh, you can solve a gross pitaevsky equation essentially in H1. But this was for a finite energy solution. And so what did uh, Betuel and Smith is to extend this ID uh, to perturbation of the vortex solution. And so they introduce a space, which is this space B. And what is this space? Uh, this space is essentially the properties of the vortex solution. So the vortex solution is bounded. The potential term is in L2. The gradient of the modulus is in L2. And it is also smooth. And here you can uh, check this property by assuming that the Laplacian of V is in all the small spaces for K uh, that are to, to zero. So then you take a function V0 v in this space, possibly it has an infinite energy, it's not a problem. Uh, you consider uh, an initial datum given by V0 in H1. And what you can do is the fact that there exists a unique solution with V0 fixed and the function psi, which is going a continuous function with values in H1. And moreover, it is possible to introduce uh, the normalized uh, energy, which is given by this formula. And this energy is conserved along the flow of the uh, equation. And this is why actually the solution is global in time. What is the trick in order to introduce this quantity? So here we recover the potential term, the usual potential term. You only have to anomalize the kinetic part of the energy. And what you are going to do is simply the following expansion. So you have a gradient of V0 psi square. And you are going to write it as the gradient of V0 square plus the uh, first term, so the gradient of V0 and psi plus and then you integrate. And so what you have in this setting is the fact that psi, sorry, psi is in H1. So this term is well defined. This one is not well defined because this is of infinite norm in L2. But uh, you simply integrate this term by part. What you have then is this. Now this is in L2 and this is in L2 also. So this term is well defined. And concerning the last term, this is of infinite energy. But the point is that this is this does not depend on time. So simply you drop this term. Since it does not depend on time, there's no difficulty with this term. And you have a renormalized version of the energy that is conserved along the field. And so, using this result, it is possible to analyze the stability properties of the vortex solution, at least for d equal to one or, or minus one, uh, and in particular, the orbital stability. So now I come to my main results. So in order to set them, I first have to introduce uh, a functional framework in which uh, the results are weak. Yeah. So, so on the previous one, the we not to pay it infinitely, right? So, so, your, so this doesn't include uh, the vortex. Yeah. Yes, this includes the vortex. You can take V1 for V0. So you the can- The of V1 is like one over R square at infinity, so it's not in H infinity. Yeah. Uh, uh, this, uh, oh, it is actually, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is. Yeah, because yeah. You, know, okay. um, you have to, the gradient of V is like one over R squared. Yeah? yeah, yeah. And then when you differentiate, you gain uh, R at each time of differentiation. And so this is. Uh, Not in L2, though. Yeah, This is now too, sorry. Yeah, it's square. <laughs> sorry, it's square. square. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the gradient of V is just not in L2. So uh, each time you differentiate, everything yeah. is in L2.
So now I come to my functional setting. So uh, what is the metric in our work? The metric is here. So um, if you look at the function of psi, uh, can write under this form, it's modulus and argument. And if you look at the perturbation of uh, vertex position E1, for instance, you know that it has a topological degree at infinity, which is equal to one. So that you, you can write the phase function as this, with something which is uh, degree one, and something which is of degree zero, more or less at infinity. And in the work by Neuronescu, there was a trick uh, in order to prove the result, which was essentially in this setting uh, to divide by V1. So you divide by V1. And when you divide by V1, you are going to divide here by uh, the, the modulus of V1. And then V scales this. And this has uh, topological degree at infinity, which is more or less zero. And then um, it is possible that this quantity has um, a thing against Bernardo energy. Okay, it depends on the gradient of the piece. But here there is a problem, which is the fact that this is equal to zero if x is equal to zero. Okay, because the modulus of the uh, one that <laughs> So what is the trick in our work? It is not to divide by this function. But instead of dividing in this function, what we want to do is to kill this. And so we are going to multiply by the complex conjugate. In multiplying by the complex conjugate, what you have done is almost the same thing, but uh, there is no division by zero. Okay. And so this has a chance to be of uh, finite kinetic energy. And so we are going to introduce a functional setting in which uh, we impose this kinetic term. So we impose that this term is finite. And then there is a difficulty because you lose something at the origin because we want vanishes at the origin. And then you have to add some extra control at the origin. And a good way to add this control is to use this quantity. So we will see in the sequel why it is good to use precisely this quantity. Notice that the origin, uh, this is zero, so that this is one, and this control, the uh, L2 norm of the gradient close to the origin. But this is not enough in order to deal with the problem. So with these properties, you control the kinetic energy, but you have to add also the potential term. And in order to add the potential term, what we simply do is simply uh, to add the fact that one minus the square of modulus of psi is in L2. Here there is a difficulty, which is the fact that this is no more a vector space. So you have to introduce a metric structure on this space, which is given by this norm, uh, plus uh, this term, and this is a distance. And what you can prove is that uh, uh, the, this distance handles uh, E with the complete. Yes. So here yeah, there is a difficulty with this norm. It is the fact that this norm is not invariant with respect to transition because we fix V1. So this is only the difficulty. So in the sequel, I will consider any function in this space E. And then the first result is about the minimizing nature of the vertex solution. So what we prove is the following fact. So it is possible to introduce the renormalized Gisvalando energy which is well defined in the previous functional setting. And we introduce in the most natural way, so you know that everything is well defined on balls, and then you take the limit when the, the size of the ball is standing to infinity. And uh, so you can prove that this is well defined. It is clear that in, this quantity is invariant with respect to constant phase shift, because actually the density of the Gins-Berlando energy is invariant with complex, uh, with uh, constant phase shift. But this is no more clear that uh, this is invariant with respect to translation, but this is the case. Uh, so you see that uh, if you want to look at a translation of psi, essentially you have to translate the ball here. And uh, the fact that this quantity is invariant with respect to translation is due to the property that if you compute the energy 
of V1 under the difference of two balls when the size of the radius tends to infinity, this difference tends to zero. And then this quantity is invariant with respect to transition. So now you have a good notion of the Gisbergland energy. And then what you can prove is the fact that V1, or alternatively V minus one, is the unique global minimus uh, for this energy. And of course, this is up to translation and constant phase shifts that are the natural geometric invariants for this uh, energy. Actually, the second part of the result is a more or less direct consequence of a result by uh, Mironescu. Because if you have a minimizer for this uh, quantity, then it is a, a locally minimizing a stationary solution of the equation. And so that it is equal to V1 if the degree at infinity is V1 up to the geometric index. The next result is about a quantitative stability estimate. So this is more or less an extension of the work by uh, Delpino, Fenmer, and Kovacic. Uh, in order to state uh, this result, I have to introduce the orbit of a function psi. So what is the orbit? It is the function psi up to the invariances. So you have a constant phase shift and a procedure translation. And then what you proved is the fact that if uh, at, uh, you have a function such that psi is essentially close to the orbit of V1, then uh, the renormalized energy of psi controls the square of the distance between the psi and the orbit of V1. So this is a coercivity estimate. So it is not stated as a, what I have said. You know, the orbit is not on V1, but on psi. So this is due to the fact that uh, this quantity is not invariant with respect to translation. So when you write your estimate, you have to translate everything at zero. And this is why here uh, we have the function V1, and this is the distance between the orbit of psi and V1, and not the contrary. So you have this result, and once you have proved this result, you can prove a result of orbital stability. Uh, so you take an initial datum in your uh, functional space, E. And it turns out that you can use the result by Beethoven and uh, Smith. So you have to extend the global well contrast that was proved by uh, Beethoven and Smith in their setting in, uh, to this space. In, but it is possible, it is uh, not so difficult. Then you have a flow corresponding to this initial datum. And what you can prove is the following is the fact that if at initial time psi zero is a perturbation of V1, then for any time it remains a perturbation of V1 up to the geometric invariancy. So the geometric invariances are here included by the fact that you can construct a position fraction A, which is of class C1, the flex function phi, which is of class C1, such that up to this function you remain close to V1. So this is small, so that uh, this function is close to this one. And you can uh, compute uh, ordinary differential equation with respect to time for A and phi. And you have also this control of the derivative with respect to time of A and with respect to time of phi. Uh, what is this? It is some very weak uh, estimate in order to say that essentially uh, this is stationary. But you know, this is very weak because this is only a control on the derivative with respect to time of A and phi. Uh, to my knowledge, the question to know if you can drop these parameters is open. And this is why this is only an orbital stability result and <coughs> stability result. Okay, So the simple version of a stability result would be to take a perturbation at initial time of V1 and this remains a perturbation at the initial time of E1 <coughs> without uh, this uh, uh, concerning the proof of this result. So it is based on this uh, estimate. Uh, you see, <coughs> at initial time, psi zero is close to V1. Uh, since the anomalous energy is conserved along the flow, this means that at, initial at any time, this quantity is, remain is going to remain small. Okay. Uh, so what you have to prove is the fact that this is conserved along the flow, but this is okay. 
and uh, the construction of the parameters a and phi is something very classical in the context of um, uh, nonlinear Hamiltonian partial differential equation. So we, this is something which was uh, introduced by Weinstein, I believe, uh, for the orbital stability of the ground states to the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So in order to construct this parameter, uh, in order to deal with the spectral problem, you have you have to um, introduce orthogonality condition. And then you, you define uh, these parameters using this orthogonality uh, condition with an implicit function theorem. And then in order to uh, compute the derivative with respect to time, you simply have to uh, differentiate your, your orthogonality conditions. Okay. So this is something quite classical and the proof is uh, entirely based on this. A further remark concerning this uh, problem, there is another notion of uh, stability uh, that is the uh, uh, asymptotic stability. So what is asymptotic stability? Is to take a perturbation at initial time, and instead of, of proving that a perturbation remains a perturbation, what you want to prove is that a perturbation is going to tend, in some sense, towards the vortex solution, perhaps up to uh, the parameters that are here, but you want to prove some convergence. And to my knowledge, this question is also open for uh, the, the vortex solution. Yes? But it's not clear to me whether uh, when you start from V1, uh, the difference between V1, uh, a translate of V1 and V1 is a uh, valid time. Uh, it does not necessarily remain close. You have to translate in this result. Yeah, but uh, if I take uh, if I take uh, a translate of V one, I subtract V one. Yeah. Is it a psi in the space? Yeah, it, it is in this. Uh, it satisfies this condition. But uh, this is not the same. You know, in a, if you have some traveling ways, there is an obstacle to. Uh, the simplest form of stability, which is the fact that your solution is going to translate and that uh, for large time it is no more a perturbation of the initial uh, solution. But in this context, this is not so clear because everything is stationary. So if you take a uh, vortex uh, solution a bit translated, <coughs> it is close at any time to the initial one. So, Possibly, you can prove this result without the modulation parameters. There is, to my knowledge, there is no counter example to simple counter example to this property. Okay, so now, in order to conclude this talk, I would like to give uh, some details on the proof of uh, at least theorem one and perhaps uh, maybe one so uh, what is theorem one? This theorem one is this result in which uh, we have the fact that this phenomenon is not the energy is well defined. And okay, this is a consequence of the work by Mionescu, so what I will not give any detail on this part. I would get, like to give details on this uh, on this property. And so in order to define properly this phenomenon's energy, what I'm going to use is the fact that when you compute Square of the gradient of this quantity, which is the, the trick that we introduce, uh, you can relate this to the square of the gradient of psi, and more precisely to the difference of the square for psi and v1. What is, that is the quantity that you want to anomalize. So if you are going to consider this, to integrate this on balls, and then you want to take the limit when the size of the ball tends to infinity. So for this term, there is no problem. It is part of your functional setting. This one is also okay because the first line here is exactly the norm that you, we have introduced. Okay, so this is well defined in our functional setting. Then you go to this term. So this, uh, the gradient of V1 is not in L2, but it is in L4. So that this is in L2. You have a potential term. This is in L2, so L2, L2, this is integrable, no difficulty. And then you have this term. So due to the fact that this term is finite, this is in L2. But here there is a difficulty, which is the fact that essentially psi is of the one at infinity. And then the gradient of V1, or the 
complex conjugate of big gradient satisfied by following asymptotics. So at infinity, since V1 is more or less like one, this is like one over X, and this is not in L2. So this term, in principle, is not well defined when you integrate it on the R2. And so you have to do something, and then so the simplest trick is simply to take this asymptotic, you subtract it, and there is a remainder term. You do this. So here we subtract this term, this asymptotic at infinity. Not that there is a difficulty which is related to the fact that this is singular at zero, so uh, it is classical. You introduce a repeated function, which is one on the ball, and this is uh, supported at infinity outside the ball. Uh, it is important that uh, this uh, cutoff function is radial. In the then this is in L2, this is in L2, this is more or less bounded, and so you can put it in there. And then there is this uh, remainder. And in order to deal with this uh, remainder term, what uh, you are going to use is the fact that in our setting, the function psi multiplied by the complex conjugate of V1 is a finite Gins Verlando energy. This is clear for the kinetic term, but you can also check that it is clear for the potential term. And then you can use a previous result by Patrick Gerard, uh, who uh, described the function in the energy space uh, in order to prove its result for the global wet spotness of the respiratory equation in the, in the energy space. And in this uh, paper, he provided a decomposition of any function <coughs> in the Zalando equation in dimension two, which is given by a complex uh, exponential with a phase such that the gradient uh, is in L2, and an extra term which is in, S, in H1. Essentially, this term encoded uh, what happens at infinity. And the remainder term is in, uh, in H1. And you put this in this term. And uh, so this is an easy computation. You are going to obtain this. So now the value is in H1, so that this is in L2, L2, and no problem. Actually, you have also some decay at infinity, so it is better. This is in L2, L2, no difficulty, and then there is uh, difficulty to define properly this thing. So for instance, the first term, you are uh, integrating on both. So the natural trick is to integrate by part, by part. If you integrate by part on a ball, uh, the divergence of this, but due to the fact that KR is gradual, the divergence of this term is equal to zero. And then you have the extra term on the circle. And the extra term of the, in the circle is equal to zero due to the fact that here you have X pair. X pair is only the, um, the vector X uh, with a rotation of angle pi over two. Okay. And so uh, integrating by parts on the ball kills everything. To do the same thing for this term, you integrate by part. The divergence is equal to zero, on the circle it is equal to zero, and then when the gradient is coming here, you recover exactly this term. And so uh, you can take the limit on, uh, on, on the balls when the size of radius tends to infinity. And at the very end, what you have is only this term on R2 and times this term on R2. And this is our way to define uh, rigorously the normalized. Uh, so when you have uh, done that, uh, you can go to the um, stability estimate. And uh, in order to obtain the stability estimate, what you have to do is simply to expand the uh, renormalized energy with respect to a perturbation in your space. Uh, but here you have to write this perturbation under three different uh, ways. So the first way and the simplest one is to use an additive representation of the perturbation. So you are going to write V1 plus epsilon. Then uh, you also have to deal with the potential term. And for the potential term, if you write this potential term, you want that this is close to one and less the square of V1. And you are going to introduce a small perturbation, which is eta epsilon. And this is something which is going to be small in L2. 
But you know, this is something which depends non linearly of uh, radiative perturbation of sign. And finally, in order to deal with this term, uh, it is also required to uh, introduce uh, perturbation with respect to the decomposition of Patrick Gerard. So you are writing the decomposition of Patrick Gerard for this function uh, when psi is equal to B1 plus epsilon. And you check that it is possible to introduce a phase function phi epsilon and W epsilon so that this quantity can be written as it is. You should have some cubic term in epsilon. Cubic term? In epsilon, no? It is in epsilon. In epsilon. epsilon. This is a, a three, three tier. Yeah. One of the three. So this is what we did. So I'm going to. Oh, oh, oh I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, 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 okay, okay. I think so. Okay. So now I come to the expansion. So, okay. You have the randomized energy of V1 plus epsilon. So, the zero order term is the energy of V1, but this is equal to zero due to normalization. So, no zero order term. No first order term because V1 is a critical point. So, no first order term. So then you have the second order terms. So, the second order terms concerning the kinetic part, they are essentially here. This is the kinetic part expanded with respect to epsilon. This quadratic form. So this is a quadratic form with respect to epsilon. And then you have your normalization. So the term P epsilon corresponds to the normalization of this term. And this expression is explicit, it is given by here, and it is supported at infinity due to the cutoff function, which is at infinity. And then concerning the um, potential term, the variance of part of the potential term here, actually, but most of the potential term is simply given by this quantity. There is a big advantage to, uh, to keep this quantity because you see, this is what I need. Yeah. If you write it uh, with respect to uh, uh, the power three of epsilon, the power four of epsilon, it is not so easy to say that this is coercive, but this is coercive. And then uh, you want to prove a, st a class stability estimate, a class stability estimate. So you are going to control any term. Concerning the, the term coming from renormalization at infinity, this is quite direct. But what you have to prove is the fact that actually the function that are here can be controlled with respect to epsilon and beta epsilon. So you can prove that W epsilon, the gradient of W epsilon and the gradient of phi epsilon is controlled by the square of the norm of epsilon and the square of the norm of eta epsilon in L2. And what is the trick here? The trick is that this is supported at infinity. You have some decay here. So uh, you have a decay at infinity. If you take R large enough, this term is small. Then you look at the potential term encoded by uh, this quantity. So the first idea is to expand this term with respect to epsilon. And then you recover the quadratic part, the cubic part, and the quadratic part. But there is a difficulty in our setting, which is the fact that the quadratic term is not necessarily well defined because you can choose as a perturbation V1. And so if you take V1 here, at infinity, this is one, and uh, this is of uh, infinite L2 norm. So you, can, you cannot do this. So actually, this was what uh, was done by uh, Delpino, Felmer, and Kovacic. They put the fact that in a functional setting, this is finite. And this is why you cannot uh, handle with uh, uh, constant phase shift invariants. So next, uh, in order to deal with this term, you are going to decompose your problem in something that is localized and something at infinity. So you keep localized part. And for the non-localized part, you have two things. So at infinity, this is exactly this quantity. <laughs> and here, you have also the localized term, the cubic and the quadratic localized term. But the cubic and the quadratic localized term are controlled by this. And so you have something which is not really a progressivity estimate, but you have an estimate for this quantity like this with something which is small with respect to a power two plus this term. And then you have to deal with the extra term. So the extra term is this quadratic form. So here you have this term. Not that this term is non-negative. 
And you have uh, the term coming from the, essentially the kinetic part of the energy. And what you can prove for this term is the following. From quadratic form, you can prove that up to three orthogonality conditions, this is coercive. So this controls this quantity. What are the three orthogonality conditions? They are the orthogonality condition with respect to the derivatives of V1 coming for the translation invariance, and also from IV1 coming from the uh, constant phase shift invariance. Not here, but uh, these quantities are not integrable, therefore, so uh, we impose some cutoff uh, function also in order to provide a rigorous meaning for this term. Then you have your coercivity estimate. So your coercivity estimate controls this term and this one. Then you add this to this. So using this control, you still this. And so now you control this term and this term. So this is okay because this is small when uh, epsilon tends to zero. And you have this extra term. Then you take R large enough, and this extra term is controlled by this one and this one. And so you have your passivity. Uh, so okay. about this, you see that it is a bit complicated here. Uh, actually, uh, we can prove this uh, result for any choice of the number kappa zero, okay, which is here, which is positive. And for any number R zero large enough, uh, you, you, uh, we have some where to use some pigeonhole principle in order to control some term. And this is why the, uh, the radius R is not fixed a priori, but it's, it is fixed in a bounded range with respect to R. So this explains why it is written as it is. So just a word concerning the proof. Uh, Sorry, R depends on epsilon. Sorry? The number run R you, you select by the pigeon principle. Yeah, exactly. Right on epsilon, on the function epsilon. Uh, and it's only depending on yes, it depends on the function epsilon, yes. Uh, but uh, the only uh, required property is the fact that it is controlled by SU because you need this in order to deal with this term. But uh, yes, SU depends on epsilon. Uh, sorry, R depends on epsilon. It depends, uh, you know, it depends on the energy of uh, annulus between R0 and uh, this power of R0. So you can you in principle it's not possible to fix it for any function epsilon. So I will conclude just by saying a word with for the proof of this uh, result. So the proof is based on um, uh, something that was already uh, in the work by um, Ionescu and then Pino Felmer and Kovacic concerning the stability, their stability estimate. Uh, you are essentially to uh, use an orthogonal uh, de uh, Fourier decomposition of epsilon with respect to the angular uh, variable. And then you write uh, the quadratic form with respect to this decomposition, and you prove that uh, each of these quadratic forms are coercive. So this is clear when the Fourier number is large, because you see here that when the Fourier number is large, this term is very large, and this kills this. And so you have to deal essentially with uh, Fourier sectors where j is equal to zero and plus or minus one. And then for these uh, Fourier sectors, you have to use the, um, the orthogonality condition in order to prove uh, uh, the passivity. Uh, but this, uh, okay, in our setting, it is a bit more complicated. But it is essentially, it is very similar to what was done by uh, Ionescu in the ball or Del Pino Fermat. Uh, so that I will not uh, describe it completely. And uh, I will conclude this talk here. And thank you very much, Philippe.